The sport of off-road racing is full of incredible stories, wild characters, legends, and even villains. We cover it all on offroadracer.com, but there's only so much we can put down in an article. Sometimes we have to dig a little deeper, and that means sitting down with some of our industry's most influential characters and hitting record. Welcome to the Off-Road Racer Podcast, a Mad Media production, made exclusively for offroadracer.com. Each month, we'll go beyond the dirt into the homes, shops, and lives of the most interesting and game-changing icons of our sport. You'll hear about their history, success, failure, and everything in between as we pull back the curtain and reveal the stories of their lives. I'm your host, Matt Martelli, and this is the Off-Road Racer Podcast. This episode of the Off-Road Racer Podcast is powered by Monster Energy. Earlier this year, in January of 2020, Casey Curry became the first American to ever win a four-wheel class at the world-famous Dakar Rally, giving him the biggest win of his career. The only way to explain it would be like the Baja 1000, 800 miles in, it's a thousand mile race, and all of a sudden they're like, hey, at your last pit, 200 miles from the finish, we're gonna give you your time back, but we're gonna pull your helmet off and we're gonna do an interview and ask you what it's like to win, right? You would lose your mind as a driver. Anybody would lose their mind. In this episode of the Off-Road Racer podcast, we talk with Casey about winning Dakar, the lifestyle of being a second-generation off-roader, his race career, off-road as a business, balancing family life, and what it feels like he has yet to accomplish. Well, it's been a while, dude. So what have you been up to lately? Uh, it's been a crazy year. Uh, you know, COVID has kind of changed things for this year, but overall, uh, you know, pro kind of in the process of taking over my dad's uh, family business. So I've been doing a bunch with that. So blessing in disguise with COVID, the, without traveling and, and racing, been doing a lot of uh, focus on career enterprises and, you know, just taking the time to also enjoy my family and my, uh, my two little boys. Well, tell us a little bit about your family business. I mean, I, I know what it is, for, but for the average guy, tell, explain what Curry Enterprises is. Curry Enterprise, we build aftermarket rear ends for muscle cars and hot rods and off-road trucks and Jeeps and you know, Ford Raptors and military vehicles and street sweeping and uh, you know, a very unique, broad uh, array of basically drivetrain components. So um, you know, we've been in business for 50 years. My grandpa started it, my dad runs it. And, now I'm taking over the reins right now. We're in the process, so it's a, it's been a massive learning curve. But you know, it, it's a fantastic company. It's family owned, and I never want to see that go away. So, you know, what was that like for you growing up within off-road racing and the off-road business? You know, for me, it's just been my life. Uh, you know, my grandpa was an off-road racer and a car racer, and my dad was always been an off-road racer, and my uncles being competitive as well, like. It's just the norm, like that's what we did. Like our hobbies uh, and always included the desert, uh, racing, and in just literally enjoying the family time, you know. Uh, growing up, we lived on the same street as my uncles and my grandparents. Um, so we always had my cousins around. So like the, the family aspect for us was always being around, you know, the Curry Enterprise as a company and the lifestyle that we live to promote our brand. And you know, now you have two kids you know, obviously and married. Um, so are you gonna raise your kids the same way? You know, I always, up until I had kids, I was like, my kids are never gonna be ra racers. All I want them to do is play piano, play golf and uh, hang out. But uh, right now all they wanna do is ride dirt bikes. So I'm, uh, I'm enjoying the time. We uh, have a dirt bike track at our house. We actually uh, moved um, a couple years ago out to Corona and now basically created a compound with my parents. So we have a compound with a motocross track and. Uh, very, very blessed to, uh, you know, keep the family traits going. But, uh, you know, whatever they want to do, they can do. And right now, they're all about dirt bikes. So we ride dirt bikes a lot. Uh, they have the new things, those Stasics. So they rip their Stasics around daily. And, you know, but yeah, they love it. They love Jeeping. They love riding Can-Ams and just overall love being out in the desert. That's cool. So they're growing up off-road. Oh, they are definitely growing up off-road. Um, you know, you're a businessman, your father, you have two kids. 
uh, and your racer. Is, is it hard to balance all of that? You know, I would say up until coronavirus hit, I would say I thought I had it all dialed in. I was racing, you know, for me, I was racing 45 weekends out of the year. And when I say racing, I'd say, you know, we're out doing events and, and training and testing and uh, doing everything. 45 weekends out of the year is close to 25 weeks out of the year. And, uh, you know, I thought I had it figured out and like it was all working. And then, you know, having the lockdown and being at home is like it, it showed a true whole new side of, you know, my wife and my kids that, you know, I've totally fallen in love again with everything that goes on at home. And, you know, I feel that I don't know if things will ever be what they were, uh, how I wanted to travel. Uh, I feel that I do want to be home more. Um, so, you know, it, it's hard, like, dude, to be competitive and to try to win and, and uh, be on top of the game, it's not something that's just going to happen without putting 110% effort into it. So it's essentially it's realigned your priorities. Oh yeah, COVID has totally realigned my priorities. I feel like now looking forward in the future, it, if I'm going to do anything, it has to be worth it for financially, you know, like first, it's all about my kids. Like there's a rift to put over, you know, it's not just me. I'm not winging it anymore. Like I got a, I got a wife and kids that need, you know, a home and food and, and school and everything else. And if I'm going to go anywhere or do anything, it, it has to make financial sense. You know, so let's talk a little bit about your wife, Allie, former Miss Mint. You know, she's been involved uh, with your racing since you guys first started dating, right? And now she got to step into the driver's seat with a rebel rally. That's pretty cool. Yeah, like, you know, obviously she's been around it. Uh, I met her before I had Monster, which is probably one of the reasons I still have Monster because instead of being out partying, right, I was in that love stage of, you know, meeting her as, you know, my girlfriend and, and really being able to focus on my career, which she always, she's basically open-armed everything I've ever wanted to do with my racing career. And, you know, if it wasn't for her, the opportunities wanted to come my way just with how much work and, uh, determination I needed to focus on my career and um, a couple of years ago we had the idea of like hey like let me build you a vehicle for fun and go do the rebel rally and then this year I was like man like the stars are really aligning like we you know I'm in the process of taking over career enterprises and with the with taking over career enterprises I need to really <laughs> leave less and uh, I'm like you know what like I feel like she's always like loved going to the desert she loves being with me and loves just partaking in everything and i was like hey why don't you go out and like let's do the rebel rally i'll pay all the money i'll pay everything um, but you just do it on your own i'm not going to be a part of it at all i'm going to build you the raddest jeep you you know out there but as far as like you learning like we're going to work with emily miller and we're going to allow emily miller and you and all the other girls associated with rebel to teach you I'm not going to do anything. And literally, that's what we did. I literally gave her the keys to my, my Jeep on 40s, sent her to Ridgecrest. She did like three day driving school and like literally just fell in love with it herself. And like my whole thing with, with Allie is that she's never driven anything out of all my UTVs and all my Jeeps and everything I have. Like she's literally driven none of them. She has driven one Jeep to, to take the kids to school on like a Tuesday. And, uh, but never driven off road, never put a vehicle in four wheel drive. And uh, I literally sent her to the desert. I was like, I'm not gonna give you anything. Literally, you, I want you to learn through, like, through the crowd of off-roading. She, uh, when she left from here, right here in Corona, California, and drove out, did it all by herself, slept in, uh, slept in a tent for nine nights, which I was like, super funny. I, I had my own motor home with a driver and a car. <laughs> and you, the first rally you get to go to, you're sleeping in a tent for nine days. But the experience was phenomenal. You know, she never had to work on the vehicle. You know, the getting stuck in the sand dunes never happened. And, uh, but overall, like, I think, like, she got a new true understanding of what jeeping and how empowering the women are in the sport. And, like, that's my big thing as, like, a business owner. Um, and now, like, being my wife married in and her last name being Curry is that I want her to really be able to share her experiences and let us help share her story. Because I feel like, she didn't grow up doing it. She grew up in Long Beach in a, in a normal family. And, you know, when I say normal, like not a family that was into off-roading and like right. how fun and how family oriented what we do is. Well, and to your point, it's transformative, right? You know, you, you go through this process of, you know, trials and tribulations, whether it's the Mint 400, the Ba 1000 or Dakar, and you come out the other end transformed. Yeah, I would say, yeah, she, 100%. Like, she literally came out of it. And 
She's just been fantastic. I think that it's making us closer than we ever have. I think that now, like, uh, as being a stay-at-home dad, I, there's a lot of things that I've never seen that I saw for the first time. And, and I think there's a lot of things she, uh, she saw that happened there that now made her realize some of the pressures that I went through in life. Nice, that's really cool that you guys can share that experience. Um, you know, let's talk about winning Dakar. I mean, what an incredible thing to, you know, have on your resume, but experience. I mean, you and I have known each other for a long time and, you know, you've worked your butt off to get to this point and to have this opportunity. So, you know, what, what was that like for you, not just winning Dakar, but being the first American to do it on four wheels? You know, I would say the funny thing, like, I, I've been learning more about myself lately is the fact that after winning the car and the, the couple months after is that I don't, I've learned that I'm not addicted to the victory, I'm addicted to the journey. But you know, obviously the journey to have the best outcome is always a, a part of the, the journey, right? And the reason that I've like, you know, I've getting ready for the car and everything that I've done that you don't really think is that important until you start looking back is, you know, like I won the Abu Dhabi challenge and the Inca challenge and uh, a, cha a race in Africa. I've, I've raced all over the world in preparation um, to, to try to win Dakar, including training in the United States with guys like Ricky Brabeck and Andrew Short and Jimmy Lewis and, you know, the hours and hours spent out in the desert, like all that really comes down to like, for me, uh, it's the journey, man. It, it really is the journey and, and all the process that takes to be a, a champion of any sort. Totally. But, you know, one of my questions was, you know, did that feel, was that a little bit redeeming winning that race? I, I mean, it, it was so surreal that it's one of those things I don't know if I'll ever actually realize what we were able to accomplish. You know, like going into it, like, uh, no Americans ever won. In all 40 something years, no Americans ever won. And top elite Americans have tried in all categories. And uh, no, it's just never been done. And, you know, you sit there and go, like, I, dude, I feel like we have everything it's going to take. Like, but it just takes one bad day. And, you know, like they always say, like, man, you're going to win the rally on your worst day. You really start understanding what that means when you get into that situation. But I would say that. It, I, it didn't hit me that we were going to win until we crossed that finish line. I was waiting. It was so nerve wracking. I've never felt that type of pressure. I've raced everything and I've never felt that type of pressure in my life uh, like winning Dakar. Yeah. And you, you know, like you said, you've raced all these other types of races in, in the desert, in the U.S., in Baja, short course racing, you know, but that was 12 days of basically doing a Baja 500. It's, people don't understand how gnarly it is. Yeah. Um, what was the process of racing like day to day, you know, hour to hour? What was that like going through that? So the biggest thing is about the car is like the first year I finished fourth and we were averaging, you know, third to fifth place every single day. And, and when you're in that situation of just being a contender, uh, it, the, it's, it's like racing the ball 500 for 12 days in a row. And that's really what it is. You're driving from 5 to 7 a.m. until 5 to 7 p.m. if you're racing at a good pace. You, yes, you can race to the night. If, if you're having bad days, you'll go through the night. Uh, it didn't happen night. It hasn't happened to me yet, thank, thank goodness. But uh, what, I, what I've come to realize, though, is that when you're in the position to win, that the pressure starts building because the media starts asking questions in a way that they, they're trying to get a reaction out of you, right? They're trying to feel... They, want, they all want the passion of why we're doing what we're doing. And the problem is, is like, dude, it gets into your head mentally. I, like, I will say the, the craziest experience that I don't think there's any American that's ever felt it. Mine is somebody that's done like Tour de France is that two days from the finish line, it's getting heavy that like I have a 36 minute lead. And now that the interviews are coming, like you're going to win. When you win, what are you going to do? Right. You're going to win this thing. You're going to win the same. Like I have 500 race miles to go and you're saying that I'm gonna win it, like, you don't go to the Baja 500 and go to the first guy at the line and go like, it's, you got it in the bag. You don't go to the 500 and ask that question, right? And I was, my, but I'm like, the only way to explain it would be like, the Baja 1000, 800 miles in, it's a thousand mile race, and all of a sudden they're like, hey, at your last pit, 200 miles from the finish, we're gonna give you your time back, but we're gonna pull your helmet off and we're gonna do an interview and ask you what it's like to win, right? You would lose your mind as a driver 
anybody would lose their mind. And that's where I look at it going like, there, there's no other, I don't know how to explain it because you're never gonna have that situation happen. No, you, like, you're hundreds of miles from a victory. Hundreds, yeah. and, and in terrain that I know nothing about, like it, it could be sand, rocks, cliffs, gnarly navigation like there's so many variables that could throw it all away and and we're i mean you remember we're in a race car that could break anything could happen like you could have a problem that could take two hours to fix or you dnf or you flip the car over and like so with all that going through your head like these people are asking those questions every day and so at night as soon as you pull in like another big difference is that when you finish the stage before your liaison is where there's media right that's the tv media that you're going to see on tv in the united states and around the world, but you're gonna get that instant media, right? So that's the, how'd you do? Okay, according to times, like they have it on their phone. Like, it looks like you won the stage or you right. got second. Right. But then you drive another 150, 200 miles and get to the finish. And then you get out of the car, you do a debrief with your team. And then wham, here it is, media, 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 like this. Oh my God, are you, are you prepared? Is your car okay? Did you damage it? Is it broken? You're like, dude, I, you know, I don't know. Like, dude, I just gotta let the team do their deal, right? But you start going like, man, how, how can you train for that? Like, there's no way you, I don't care what type of racing you do. Like, you, to put yourself in that situation, like, th there's no type of racing in the United States to do that. It, well, you know, last year in particular, you were a seasoned guy. You, people knew that you were a competitor, but they didn't expect you to win. Oh, yeah. And they, there was some even, some stuff <laughs> at the end that some rules suddenly changed oh, yeah. and, and that threw you for a loop. To talk, talk, what was that like, you know? I, you know, the hard thing is, is like, you don't really know because the politics are so deep. It's FI, it's, it's, I mean, that whole organization is gnarly. I mean, you play by their rules and like, dude, when they want to change the tire rule and make every car in, you know, in UTV category that was basically a contender for overall wins, we had to change our rim size. Well, dude, that turned into a nightmare for us. And like, even the, the uh, OT3 cars were like watching the documentation of what was going on, like, they were, they had to change their tire and wheel size, right? So it wasn't like I was alone, but they were doing this stuff day six of a 10 day event you're going like crazy. how is this even possible yeah. like you are putting me through the ringers on what you're asking and like the pressures that you're putting on me are like you're literally just twisting in a way that you're looking for a failure somewhere sure and w what did that feel like oh i mean but the only thing you can do is you know ride the wave like there's there's nothing you can do and like now looking at it more in life like it just teaches you that when things get thrown at you, man, you gotta make lemonade. No matter, every time you get lemons, you gotta throw, you gotta make lemonade. Like, you really have to learn to keep your cool and understand that everything has a reason, right? Things are gonna be put in front of you for the pressures. And like, for me, it's like that ability to, to strive. Like, how, how can we overconquer the, the situation in front of us? You know, so we were talking earlier and this year you chose to sit out of Dakar, but do you, do you feel like your win has, you know, paved the way or sounded the alarm for Americans? Because I know personally of, you know, a handful of Americans and American teams that now look at it as possible. Yeah, I mean, I'm, that would be the goal. The goal is to get more people to go. I think the event is amazing. I think the challenge is unreal. And I think that the more people we can get to go to tell the story of how unbelievable it is, it, it's only going to help the sport as a whole. And yeah, for myself, like sitting this year out just, you know, with with the coronavirus and the COVID-19 thing and, you know, my family and the family business, like I felt that for myself in 2021, like in the beginning of the year, I don't want to put myself in a situation to uh, leave my family right now. And, uh, you know, it's a personal choice and I feel that we'll come back stronger. You know, there's more opportunity in this world and we're going to take this time uh, to focus on ourselves and to new projects that I feel will only make everything in the future better and you know my goal is to go back in 2022 and and run with an elite program let's go let's go back to focusing on lifestyle so earlier you were talking about living the lifestyle of of off-road and i think you've done a, a pretty good job of of documenting you know your lifestyle of you and your crew going to moab and going to glamis and you know, going and doing the Rubicon Trail. Are, are we going to see more of that from Casey Curry? Oh, absolutely. You know, the biggest thing that I've realized is that I, I love, like I said about Dakar, I love the journey um, of, of the lifestyle that we live. And really, it all comes down to Curry Enterprises and the way that I was raised uh, from my dad and from my grandpa. And, you know, really what it comes down to is that 
I love everything that the desert has to give, and I love Glamis and the uh, you know the Rubicon Trail with the trees, and in Moab, Utah, with the red rock, and. You know, like my thing right now is like, even with my dad is for me giving back. And my dad has been doing some trips for me because I've been so busy. I've been allowing my dad, when I say allowing, my dad has been going with my film guys and going out and, and doing some amazing trips. And like, you know, just seeing him smiling again and enjoying what we, he's given to me and now giving back, right? He seriously quit everything he did to focus on my race career. I mean, he completely gave up all his hobbies to follow and allow me to chase my dreams, you know, not financially, but as far as the weekends go, you know, he was there for every single victory and every single loss that I ever had, except for Dakar, he didn't show up at Dakar. But heartbreaker, because we never get the visa signed. But, uh, you know, my thing is moving forward. The lifestyle side is what I want to, you know, we're going to be, we're going to be back. We're going to be doing more than ever. And like, I want everybody to join us. I want anybody that owns a Jeep or owns a UTV, I want them to come wheel with us and, and explore and, you know, for me is learn, give back, right? You have questions, you want to know more about Jeeps or you want to know what to do next in your Jeep. Dude, I want to be there to answer those questions. You know, I built every Jeep in every form. I have all kinds of styles and like, I love giving my feedback and my, you know, my opportunity to, to show you why we do what we do. Yeah, I mean, look, you're definitely from a Jeep family, but it was funny because I remember talking to you about how cool these UTVs were and then when you got into them, you got, you went you went <laughs> deep, right? What is it about the UTV platform that you think is so valuable? You know, I think the, the hard thing or the best thing about the UT, UTV platform it's the it's the only thing that you can get those type of speeds out of. When you show up to Glamis, there there ain't no Jeep, there ain't no vehicle that you can buy that you can do 80 miles an hour in three foot tall whoops stock with your kids in the back and hanging out with a nice chest and stereo going. And that is what's so crazy uh, about, you know, the U whole UTV market. My Ford seat Can-Am with my kids in the back, you know, doing 70 miles an hour and you're going like, this is incredible. Like we are covering so much ground in a vehicle that is so comfortable. Yeah, you can tow it behind your Jeep or your, you know, put it in your toy hauler and go out to the desert. And like, there ain't there ain't no Jeep that it's, it's as fast as a Can-Am and I'm not gonna sit there and twist it that, you know, Jeeps are. And that's why, to me, that UTV market, like, it is so much fun. I'll give the keys to any, I'll give the keys to anybody that's never driven a UTV and guarantee they come back with the biggest smile ever. Totally. Um, you know, let's, we were talking about your, you're, you were talking about your dad earlier. How much influence has your dad and your uncle uh, had on your life? Um, I mean, Dude, they are totally the heroes of everything that I've done. They are the heroes and the pinnacle of what I want to be. And, you know, it's funny, like, I feel that when I was younger, they were the, the meanest guys around because they'd just say no. But I feel like everyone's like, oh, you have all these sponsors. And, you know, like, and the thing is, is like, it's funny because, like, I look at it, a lot of the sponsors I have and a lot of the partners that I have over the years, I go, it was easier to give the deliverables to my sponsors than literally getting my dad to approve a budget of me trying to ride dirt bikes when I was, you know, 15 years old. And you look at it now going like, I'm, I'm blessed that my dad and them never gave me the financial, you know, here's cash, don't worry about sponsor program. Because, you know, with that, like I had to work for everything I was given. And, you know, I, even my uncle, like both my uncles for that matter, like, you know, they're, they are hard on me in some situations. And, I, you know, now 36 years later, you go, man, like, dude, they were so hard on me that, you know, as a businessman, as a father, and, you know, as a racer, like, the passion came from, from them. Sure. So a lot of people who don't know you don't know how long your race career has been. I mean, you're only 36, but how old were you when you started racing? So yeah, just like you're saying, you know, we did the Jeep speed thing in the desert and uh, had a lot of fun with that. You know, with my dad, you know, I prepped the car. My dad owned the car and I uh, worked for my dad at Career Enterprises just doing that. And uh, that was fun. Then went and did some dirt bike racing and, and that was fun as well. And we, we were good at it. And then my mom and everybody didn't really like the whole dirt bike thing. Obviously they're dangerous. And then, uh, you know, a short course thing came up with uh, Nissan. And when I got involved with that and, uh, fell in love and like felt, you know, that was 2006 at the end of your, yeah. And yeah, it, but you didn't f just fall in love. You started building race cars. Yeah. I mean, that's a big departure. And I want people to understand that of like, 
it's one thing to go, hey, cool, I love this, but it's another thing to go, you know, at, how, how old were you at that point? 20, 22. 22. At 22, you're like, huh, I'll build my own race car, <laughs> right? Because that's about when I met you, right? Yeah. And I'm like, who, wh who is this kid? Why does he think he can do all this stuff, you know? Yeah. And you did. And yeah. you did well. You won championships in short course yeah. and a lot of races. Yeah, I don't, you know, it's funny you said that. I never even thought about the whole building my own program. But, you know, now looking at it, yeah, I mean, I built, I think I built close to 15 or 20 pro lights um, over, my, over the years. And, uh, but I only did it because if I could sell one, that means I could, my new ideas, I could put toward the new one and, you know, like, Imagineer, right? Never. This was way before I knew anybody that knew CAD or SolidWorks or anything. And you know, we built a lot of you know a lot of race cars in the garage, and, and we did a lot with not very much. And it's funny because they're like, oh yeah, right, no way. You had it's like, no, nope, they were built in a garage. Yeah, you on, built them. Yeah, on on not good fixtures, but you know, we built a lot of amazing stuff. And you know, the people that you surround yourself with obviously make everything better. And you know, we've had a a good run and short course was amazing when it was when short course was real and popping and lively and, and like oh man it was an amazing sport to be around and you know I was blessed to be able to build race cars and have a team and hauler and mechanics and like you know you know obviously I worked my butt off to have it all and and you know looking now back at it you're, you're right I never even thought about like you know I've only driven my race cars up until the car I'd only raced basically my own cars well, yeah well then to me, this is a cool journey because then you recognize that, you know, there's some bigger opportunities and you build a hammer's car and you go racing Ultra 4, right? And then, you know, it keeps going. And, you know, I remember, you know, a few years back getting this call from you. I'm like, hey, I'm coming to race the Mint. Uh, okay. Is this, this truck legal? And I'm like, yeah, awesome. Yeah, so my whole thing was like five or six years ago, I just wanted to race, like I, I knew that I could not afford to race a trophy truck. It's just not gonna happen. Like the budgets just didn't make sense. And for me, like my twist on it was like, man, I'm a Jeep guy and I don't wanna put a body on it. And that, you know, uh, funny that, you know, so when I designed the trophy Jeep, my concept was like, I wanna just go out and race. I wanna race the desert. I wanna go fast. I wanna, but I'm like, I wanna do it in a vehicle that like first supports career enterprise. It's got a front and rear end that are both built. Uh, uh, with Korean Enterprise products, and then on top of that, like I wanted to build something unique for the Jeep market. I'm like, I want it to be the elite of the Jeeps, like the most extreme Wazoo Jeep that you can have, and that, and that's what I wanted to build. It's fast, it's mean, and uh, it, it truly is amazing uh, to get to go out and yes, like when I started racing the desert, I didn't realize that there's rules and regulations that in certain classes you have to have body work and then it turned into a political nightmare but obviously you allowed me to come out and race the men. And, it's uh, always a political right? nightmare, yeah, right? There's just... there's always a guy who's going to stand there and, and and pound his fist that you can't do this. This yeah. is not a whatever class it is because yeah. the fender's not there or whatever, right? Yes. But, you know, off-road racing's full of passionate yeah. people. Absolutely. So, that was fun. You know, let's go back to, you know, that evolution too. So, you know, you start racing longer and longer races. And, and what do you think it was about the rally raid format that made you good at it, that made you, you know, essentially fall in love with it? Because for a lot of people that don't know, it's difficult. <laughs> it's really difficult. And, you know, people look at, at footage of rally raids in Dakar in particular, and they're like, oh, that's funny. They can't drive dunes, right? Yeah. You know, they're making judgments based on what they're seeing. So what do you think it, it is about Rally Raid that, that makes you, you know, adaptable or good at it? So for me, like, uh, I'm a numbers guy. I love numbers in my head. I, lot of, lot of, I like information in my head. And I, that's something that I've just always done. Like, lots going on up there, bad or good. It's a lot going on up there. And uh, the very first time I went down to Sonora Rally, you know, co-driver had never done it before. So we were just winging it. and ended up navigating myself. So like literally driving one handed, holding the road book in my hand and like right then and there fell in love with the fact that it's like, it's, you can be in a trophy truck and if you go right and the race course is left, you can drive your trophy truck at 120 miles an hour over five foot whoops in the wrong direction. And I'm gonna take a stock Can-Am and I'm gonna go left and drive 30 miles an hour on the cap for the right distance and I'm gonna beat you by a long ways. 
right? And it takes out that like, oh, I'm going to spend more money and more money on the car. And you're going like, it's not, a, it's not about that. Like the truly navigation, human error is such a problem in the car that like you, all, if you took the guy that won it this year, like even in all categories, they still had problems. And you're going like, so if, if I would have gone even, I could have gone even slower. You know, I got flat tires and broken an axle and I lost a belt all that and I still won by 40 minutes and you're going like, so if I would have driven 10% slower, I could have won by an hour and a half, right? And you're like, wow, okay. Discipline. I, discipline, right? And you're going like, it's not about the, the bigger batter. It's like, it takes your co, I mean, your co-driver is so crucial that, I mean, you have to believe everything he says and put a hundred percent heart and soul into what he, if he tells you to go left, you have to believe him. I mean, it's like, look, off-road racing is totally a mental game, right? You, you have to first, you know, beat yourself, right, in order to win. But then Rally Raid and Dakar in particular, it, it's like next level because, you know, you've got to think all the time. Your co-driver has to think all the time. You have to trust your co-driver, you know. But again, like, do you think that that's, you're suited for that? I mean... Yeah, I, f I feel like everything that we've done my whole life racing wise, like racing short course taught me how to sprint and taught me how to be aggressive. And then the last couple of years racing the Baja 1000 and the Mint 400 and the Ball 500 and you know, the Vegas Arena, like then it taught me how to have stamina and when to, when to apply pressure and when to back off. And then when you put all that together and then you say, okay, the car is a chess game. You're not gonna win it on the first day, but you can lose it on the first day. And then you learn how to say, okay, like, I need a strategy. Where is everyone starting our, that is our competitors? Where are they starting? Are they in front of us or are they behind us? Are we gonna try to catch them or are we gonna let, are we gonna let them run, right? And then there's days when you say, all right, somebody caught us. They're two minutes behind us on time. Um, okay, that's second overall. Like, okay, he gained two minutes on us. We cannot let him believe us, meaning now we have to follow. Okay, now we push. So there's strategy every single day going into it. And it's unbelievable how much team strategy gets put in it. Because that's one thing I've realized more than ever, you cannot win Dakar alone. You can be the fastest guy, but like having team orders and having a team that the other drivers and co-drivers understand the same thing of the complete team winning Dakar, I really learned that in 2020. You know, my thing is this year, I felt that the, the other teammates that I had really allowed for me to feel comfortable in the car going off team orders and following, you know, what's gonna happen if this, and you know, we had, the what ifs, I had solutions for everything and that made it a lot better in, in that chess game. It is a chess game, right? Oh, like, yes. like it's crazy, you know, I went last year, I was, I was there cheering you on for the first uh, week or so and you know, the stuff that I saw playing out in front of me was pretty remarkable. Um, so, you know, what would you tell your, your uh, the Americans that are going back this year, like what would, what would be your advice to them? I mean, my, my advice is that you go in with a team that you know you can be with. You go with a team that you know you can be with for, for 12 days. And when I say that, like, you're going to have the 12 worst days of your life. If you can get through those 12 days with those people, then when it's better than that, you're going to be even better off. And that's where I feel like the pressures and the, you're going to have it where you think four days in a row of terrible days, you can still win. And that's hard because you got to mentally dig yourself out of it. And you got to learn that the people around you, you start getting mad at your, you know, your mechanic makes a mistake. You go and chew him out, then sure, the next day he doesn't work on your car as hard. And now he doesn't look over something. By your attitude, you can change the dynamics of the complete team. So it's like you want to sit there and play your games thinking you're Mr. Cool Guy? Like, sure, now you just blew it. That mechanic's not going to overlook what he was going to overlook before you got out of the car and run your mouth. So like you really got to learn like that you know, the team is really what's going to get you to the finish line. There's this thing that happens in, in off-road racing because of the length of the endurance, right? I, I always refer to it as dominoes. It's like one thing happens, you know, one failure happens that leads to another failure and so on and so forth. Is, is that accurate in, in, you know, what you're describing with Dakar? It's, you've got 12 days and if you, ha you have problems the first day and you freak out and you, you react and set these dominoes in motion like you've already defeated yourself. Oh, 100%. If you can't, if you're the type of person that cannot 100% reset at nighttime, 
you're never going to be successful. And that, I mean, I've learned upon myself. Like, I, I would have never told you that a year ago or two years ago before I went the first time. But, like, you have to wake up fresh-minded every single day. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to win. Let's get this done. Like, positive attitude, I mean, it, it affects everybody. You have a piss-poor attitude, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to run down on everybody in the whole area. And that's something I'm a true believer in. You're, even the teammates, look, if you want to be, if you're the best mechanic in the world and you have a crappy attitude, like, we're not, we're done. Like, it, it's not going to work. Totally. I mean, so you come back from Dakar and you've just, you've gone through this crazy, you know, challenge. And, you know, what, what was that like coming back and going back to business? And were you kind of looking at everything going, hey guys, this is no big deal because I just did 12 <laughs> days in the desert in Saudi Arabia and survived that. Like, I, I feel that what Dakar taught me is that like, that I'm, I'm a true believer. I love the journey. I'm not so much, it's the end goal is not what I'm looking for. It's, it's the journey, it's the journey along the way. And like the friends you meet, the challenge you're faced, you know, like you're saying, like I get home and like, dude, everything seems easier. Man, I mean, dude, there's no pressure. Any, it's gonna be hard to ever fulfill that pressure ever again in my life. And like, for me, it's like, dude, now looking at Career Enterprise is like, okay, my new venture of taking over and trying to run this company that's so successful already and trying to put my twist um, on opportunity for growth and performance, it's like, okay, it's all about the journey. I don't have an end goal, but dude, that journey of making everything better for, the fans and the friends and the customers, like that's what it's all about, right? That's what I loved about the car. The amount of people that literally were cheering me on, in, unbelievable. I've never felt so like proud to be an American and so proud to have like the fact that like all these people were cheering me on and the days that I was having a bad day, you'd literally go on Facebook and Instagram and people were writing you because they're watching it on TV the same day you're racing. So you're getting like, Po positive influence is coming, you know, and it's unreal. Like literally I had like, one of the crazy thing was the day before the finish, Ricky Johnson messaged me on, uh, well, text messaged me and literally was like, dude, look, here's the deal, man. No matter what happens, th the journey of what you've been able to accomplish even this far is unbelievable. Like you need to live the journey of what you're part And it's like sitting there going like, man, for a guy like him to reach out in, while he would racing. know, yeah, while I'm racing, but he knows those situations. He's been in those pressure moments and like, dude, to just get a relaxing text message from him, you're going like, oh my God, it just, it really makes the day better going like, dude, there's true believers that are, you know, my heroes looking at me going like, hey dude, just calm, like take it. You know what you have to do to win. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty, that's pretty incredible. I mean, that speaks to the culture as well of like, we have all these people within the culture that, you know, are, you know, our heroes and are willing to help. They want to share it with everybody else, right? So no, I, I think that's really cool. Yeah, no, it, it was, it was truly an amazing experience. And like, yeah, I, I loved every minute of it. It's just, if, for anybody that ever thinks it's easy, like, please go to Saudi Arabia and just try to drive the sand dunes. Yeah, exactly. Hey, I was trying to do it in a rental car and was having problems. But, you know, let's talk about the future a little bit. So you know, now you have the helm of Curry Enterprises, um, but you're, you're also continuing to compete. Um, what are we gonna see from Casey Curry, you know, in the near, fu in the near future, you know, and, uh, um, you know, in coming up? You know, so for myself, like, we're gonna keep doing, um, I wanna keep racing my trophy Jeep. I truly enjoy it. Um, I love the, the durability side of it and testing and, and just going out and enjoying it. And for me, it's really, it's showing other people the fun and, and the adventure of off-road racing. And, um, you know, we'll be at the Hammers, the Mint. Uh, the goal next year, if everything opens back up, would be the Baja 500. And then probably starting in May-ish, we're going to go do the Sonora Rally. And then what I plan to do is really start attacking my Dakar 2022 program in um, probably May of next year is, is really focusing on what what we need to do to be able to go back and, and conquer it. I'm, you know, I'm bummed that the plan is not to go to Dakar in 2021, but you know, with the cards and, and the way the world is right now, just opportunities lie everywhere. And this is my decision. And uh, uh, it's going to be an interesting 2021 for sure. No, I'm looking forward yeah. to it like everybody else is. Thanks for the time. I really appreciate it. It's always good to see you, brother. All good, man. Thank you.